Good afternoon, everyone. I, I want to start exactly as I started yesterday uh, by thanking Taylor and Ben and Mike and Lauren for all the work they've done to put together this conference. It's uh, yesterday I expressed the hope that it would be great. Now I can express the fact that it's been great, or so far has been great. Um, I want to, uh, yesterday I talked about a problem in geometry. Today I want to talk about a problem in differential topology. Um, somehow this seems strange, again, in a, a graph theory conference, uh, but actually uh, we will see that uh, underlying this problem I'm talking about, there is a lot of very interesting combinatorics. And in fact, how I got interested in this problem was a colleague of mine told me what was a purely combinatorial problem. And after I thought about it for some time, he said, well, actually, this is a real problem because it has a, a motivation in, in differential topology. So I'm going to spend a chunk of the talk giving you some background and telling you about Morse functions and telling you what this um, uh, combinatorial problem is that, that we're looking at. And then towards the end, I will, uh, I will mention some results. Uh, it's all joint work with uh, Tina Carroll at Emory and Henry College in, uh, in Virginia. But before I start, I want to um, advertise uh, another conference that's going on on the week before the, the next Mighty. The fifth Lake Michigan workshop on combinatorics and graph theory is going to happen at Notre Dame the weekend of April 21st and 22nd. And we're very pleased to have Ryan Martin give three tutorial lectures on edit distance in graphs and Bridget Tenner give three, uh, three tutorial lectures on combinatorics of Coxeter systems. So uh, it promises to be a, a good weekend too. And we have um, sponsorship from IMA and Notre Dame, so there will be uh, support for, at least some support for travel. Okay, so advertisement's over. Talk begins. Um, Morse theory is basically the business of understanding the shape of a manifold by studying smooth functions on the manifold. And it's definitely best to lead this with an example. So here's a nice manifold sitting inside the, sitting inside the plane. Um, there are some very natural smooth functions that you might put on this manifold to try and say something about the shape. And the most natural set of smooth functions are you specify some line and you ask about perpendicular distance of points on the manifold from the line. Well, you can really think of this as the process of taking that line and moving it across the manifold and looking at the various cross sections you get. The cross sections you get will exactly be the level sets of this function, perpendicular distance from the line. So what do the cross sections look like as I move this line across the manifold? Well, I start with the empty set because the line isn't hitting the manifold. And then at some moment, it will be tangent so that the cross section will be a single point. But that's fairly degenerate. Immediately, the cross section will become two points. And it will stay being two points for a long, long time until again I become tangent. It will degenerately become a point. And then it will become the empty set for a long, long time. Different lines might lead to different behaviors of the evolution of the, the level set. So for example, if I took this line here, then again, I'm going to start with the empty set. I will soon get to a point where the level sets are pairs of points. Then I will get to a, just a short stretch where the level set consists of a set of four points. And then I will get back to the level set consisting of two points, and then again, it will be the empty set. So two different lines here are giving us two different sets of level sets as the, the line moves through the, um, moves through the manifold. And so, for example, you can already say that the perpendicular distance from a line is enough to distinguish this manifold from, for example, the circle, for which perpendicular distance from the line will always give you the same evolution. Doesn't matter which line, you'll always go empty set, two points, empty set. Perpendicular distance from a line is just one example of uh, a smooth function you might have on a manifold. So now let me give you a, um, a more, uh, uh, a more robust definition of a Morse function. So for my purposes, it's so excellent Morse function is the terminology I should use, but I'll just say Morse function. A Morse function is going to be, for any manifold, so for some particular manifold, and small print, it's nice manifold, smooth, compact, oriented, without boundary. That, all of that doesn't matter because for the most part, I'll be thinking about uh, Morse functions on the circle or on the sphere. A Morse function is a generic smooth function. So smooth function means that uh, it, had the, um, uh, it doesn't have any discontinuities, doesn't have any problems, doesn't have any points of non-differentiability. What do I mean by it's generic? Well, it shouldn't do anything that a typical function wouldn't do. And one thing that means is that the critical points 
should all lie on distinct level sets. If I happen to have uh, the value 5 be two different critical points, I can just perturb my function ever so slightly, and these two critical points will become on different level sets. And the other notion of degeneracy that I need is that um, it shouldn't be the case that I have any uh, points where the second derivative vanishes at the same time where the derivative vanishes. So for example, if I'm looking at the real line, I don't really want to consider a function like x cubed because x cubed is looking like it's reaching a maximum at zero, but then it fools you, it fakes you out, and it's, it, it continues to increase. And that's because the second derivative vanishes at the same moment where the first derivative vanishes. I guess more generally what I'm saying is that if you form the matrix of second partial derivatives, that should be uh, an invertible matrix at a point where the derivative vanishes. So these are properties of a random function that a random function would almost surely have. So when I say generic function, this is always what I'm meaning. So this does not sound like it's uh, fodder for a combinatorics or graph theory talk. I'm talking about smooth functions on a smooth manifold. This is an inherently continuous topic. But in fact, there's a lot of combinatorics that goes on when one thinks about Morse functions, and we'll start to see why over the next few minutes. And uh, in particular, back in 2006, Vladimir Arnold raised a essentially combinatorial question about Morse functions. He asked, OK, you give me a manifold. How many Morse functions does it have? Well, of course, the answer is infinitely many. So you need to, to put some, some kind of control on how you're counting to, to get a, a genuine enumeration question. Uh, so first of all, this really should be up to some notion of equivalence of Morse functions. And secondly, you probably want to parameterize the Morse functions by something to make the, even the collection of equivalence classes uh, be, um, be finite. And so what we're going to do is parameterize by the number of critical points. So, so the question here is, if you're, you're given a manifold, can you say something up to some notion of equivalence? And we'll have to say what the notion of equivalence is. How many Morse functions are there? And this is now beginning to sound a little bit like a combinatorial question. So in his original discussion of this problem, Arnold introduced one notion of equivalence, which he called a geometric notion of equivalence. I'll give the definition here, but really uh, what the definition means is what you want to carry. So two functions are supposed to be geometrically equivalent if there are these orientation-preserving diffeomorphisms, one from the manifold to the manifold, the other from the reals to the reals, with the property that you can get from one function to the other by doing some suitable compositions. What this really means is you have two functions on the manifold. You're allowed to shift and stretch the manifold so that the critical points line up exactly. And then you're allowed to shift and stretch the real line so that the values taken at the critical points match up exactly. So this is probably best seen by, by a picture. Uh, let's say my manifold is the circle. My one Morse function is perpendicular distance from uh, this line. My other is perpendicular distance from this line. These two different Morse functions really are geometrically equivalent because I just need to rotate the circle slightly to make the two critical points match up perfectly. And then what are the values of the two critical points? Little a is the uh, global maximum. Capital A is the, uh, sorry, little a is the global minimum. Capital A is the global maximum. Little b is the global minimum. Capital B is the global maximum. That means this number here is smaller than this number. This number here is smaller than this number. That means there's going to be uh, an increasing function of the, a non-decreasing function of the reals that maps little a to little b and maps capital A to capital B. Uh, this is fancy language, orientation preserving diffeomorphism. I need that language when I want to talk about general manifolds, but when I'm talking about the real line, all I mean is a non-decreasing function, actually a, a monotone function, a monotone increasing function, a strictly monotone increasing function. Okay, so um, we can start playing now the game on some manifolds. And actually, I won't, I won't talk about very many um, uh, complicated manifolds. I'll talk about the, um, the sphere S1 and the sphere S2, mostly. A Morse function on the S1, which is just the circle, it's pretty easy to see that it's going to have an even number of critical points, because you locate the global minimum, and then on either side of that, there will be local maxima. And then you'll next have a local minimum, and a local maximum, and a local minimum. And you go back around, and you have to end up with an even number of points, half of them local minima, half of them local maxima. One of those local minima is the global. One of the local maxima is the global maximum. 
So let's ask the question, how many geometric equivalence classes of Morse functions are there that have a certain number of critical points? And since I know that it's an even number, I can parameterize it by a generic even number. It's convenient to do 2n plus 2 so that I'm starting at n equals 0. And what's the answer at n equals 0? n equals 0 means I have two critical points, a global minimum and a global maximum. There is just going to be one. There can be only one. There's, there's nothing to do. What about when uh, n is 1? Now I'm talking about functions which have four critical points. There are two possible functions, I think. And here are the schematics of the two possible functions. There's a global minimum at this point on the manifold. And then I have a maximum, a minimum, a maximum, maximum, minimum, maximum. But the question is, is this maximum here on the right a local maximum or is it a global maximum? And I claim that these two schematics lead to inequivalent Morse functions. So let's put in some specific numbers. Let's say the global minima are 1 and then the global maxima are 4. So I can certainly shift around these, uh, one of these circles to make the, and stretch and, and, and uh, scrunch it if necessary, to make all of the critical points match up with each other. But then I'll have a 1 matching up with a 1 and a 2 matching up with a 2. I'll have a 3 matching up with a 4 and a 4 matching up with a 3. And what increasing function of the reals maps 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 4, and 4 to 3? There aren't very many of them. There aren't any of them. So these two guys are inequivalent. And this idea leads very quickly to uh, a characterization of what the geometric equivalence classes look like for a general number of critical points. So the equivalence classes are basically going to be permutations of 1 up to 2n plus 2 where the permutation starts with 1. That's going to be my local minimum. And then what I do is I read off the, all of the other critical points, let's say going, to me, I'm going counterclockwise. To you, I'm probably going clockwise. So I read them off going clockwise. And I just see where do they stack in the list of critical points ordered uh, by the usual order. And if two functions lead to two different permutations, then this problem of an increasing function of the reals mapping a higher number to a lower number and the lower number to a higher number is going to come up. So they will be inequivalent. And the property of these permutations is that if I'm at an even point in the permutation, which is going to be a local maximum, it has to be bigger than both of its neighbors. And if I'm at an odd point, which is a local minimum, it has to be smaller than both of its neighbors. Let's have a picture. Here are two uh, Morse functions, at least I've mapped out their critical points, and one of them is corresponding to the permutation 153624. The other is corresponding to 142536. Those are different permutations. They're different alternating permutations. Notice that the 5 is above the 3 and the 1, the 1 is below the 5 and the 4, the 4 is above the 2 and the 1, and so on. And it's easy to convince yourself that these lead you to different Morse functions and that you can get an equivalence class of Morse functions out of any such permutation. So now the question of how many equivalence classes there are is the purely combinatorial question of how many alternating permutations there are. And of course, this, has, this is very, very well studied. You can uh, um, just go to online encyclopedia, and very quickly you'll find that the number of alternating permutations, if you plug it into a generating function, an exponential generating function, it will give you the tangent function. So these numbers are extremely well understood. You can do a little bit of asymptotic analysis and discover that the growth rate of the number of equivalence classes, once you take the logarithm, is around 2n log n. So everything is lovely on the sphere for this geometric notion of equivalence. I want to now mention a second notion of equivalence. This is the one that, um, that the, uh, the results that I'll talk about will be uh, related to. This was a notion of topological equivalence that Livu Nicolescu introduced at the same time as he began studying Arnold's notion of geometric equivalence. So for topological equivalence, what I'm not going to do is look at the level sets of these functions. I'm going to look at the sublevel sets. So you give me a real number 10. I'm going to look at the set of points on the manifold whose value at the function is less than or equal to 10. And as 10 moves through the reals, this collection of sublevel sets is going to evolve. It's going to start from the empty set 
and it's going to work its way up eventually to the entire manifold. And at various points, that collection of sublevel sets is going to change topologically. The points are exactly where I cross critical points. And that means that there is really a discrete set of sublevel sets. So for example, okay, if I have m critical points, then I'm going to have a sequence of m plus 1 sublevel sets. And so for example, for this Morse function here, my first sublevel set is empty. When I'm looking at the sublevel sets of input anything less than 1, there's nothing. So I get the empty set. Then I go past the first critical point 1, and what I start getting is an interval around the global minimum. Then I get to adding an interval around the local minimum 2, so the sublevel sets evolve to two intervals. And then I add in the number 3, and what happens is it merges the two intervals around 2 and 1. So now again, I'm looking at a single interval. And then finally, I add, I, I cross the critical point 4, and I've gone up to the entire circle. For this guy, the picture goes exactly the same. I start with an interval around 1. I add to it an interval around 2. Then I merge the two intervals with the interval around 3. And then finally, I get the entire circle. Adding intervals, subtracting intervals. What's the word I haven't said? Yeah, multiplying intervals, yes. <laughs> so let me, let me define now what is the topological equivalence on Morse functions. I'm going to say that two Morse functions are topologically equivalent if there are orientation-preserving maps mapping the sublevel set sequence of one onto the sublevel set sequence of the other term by term. So if you topologically can tell the difference between the evolution of the sublevel sets. So let's ask the question, how many topological equivalence classes are there? So um, I said that combinatorial objects crop up in almost every instance of this problem. So you know there's going to be a combinatorial object that's going to appear in the next few minutes. The question is, which combinatorial object is it going to be? So there is only one uh, sublevel, uh, uh, a Morse function that has two critical points. So n equals 0. When n equals 1, these are the two geometric in, geometrically inequivalent, but they are topologically equivalent, and you can do nothing else. So there is still only one when you, um, when you go to uh, n equals 1. Um, what about in general? Well, there's definitely going to be more than one now, because the function on the left starts with an interval, and then you add two, it goes to two intervals. Then you add three, it goes to three intervals. Then you add four, you merge two of the intervals. Then you add five, you merge the intervals again, so you're finally down to a single interval. Then you add six, you get the entire sphere. But the evolution of the sublevel sets goes differently for this guy. Uh, you start with an interval, then you add two, you get to two intervals. Then you add three, and now you've one super interval again. You stepped up, and now you step down again. You add four, that steps you up again. You add another interval. You add five, that merges you. You step down again. And then finally, you add six, and you're the entire manifold. OK, so I'll ask the question again. Sean, what word is missing? You were nodding. You were, you, you, you were thinking, step up, step down, step up, step up. It's a dick path, yes. This, this problem is clearly going to be a Catalan path or a dick path problem. So the non-extreme sublevel sets are non-empty unions of intervals. And each time you cross a critical point, one of two things can happen. You either add an interval or you merge two existing intervals. In other words, you subtract an interval. And so that means that the equivalence classes correspond exactly to Catalan paths or to dick paths. So you start at 0, 0. You end at 2n plus 2, 0. You either take steps up or down, and you never touch the x-axis except right at the very end. So these are the two paths corresponding to n equals 2. And the number of equivalence classes is the most well-known sequence in combinatorics, maybe after the sequence of binomial coefficients. The, the nth Catalan number is the number Tn1, uh, approximately 4 to the n. OK. So on the circle, everything is lovely. We know how many geometric equivalence classes there are. We know how many topological equivalence classes there are. Both problems have led to nice combinatorial objects. 
let's up the ante a little bit and let's think about um, the sphere, S2. So Morse functions on the sphere, smooth functions mapping the sphere to the real line are a little bit more complicated than functions from the circle. They also have the property that they have always an even number of critical points. But now it's not n local maxima, n local minima. It turns out that if you have two n plus two critical points on a function from uh, S2 to the reals, exactly n of those points will be saddle points. And the remaining points will be local maxima or local minima. But they won't necessarily be equidistributed between local maxima and local minima. So just as yesterday, there was a point in the talk where I said, if you don't want to listen to anything else I have to say, here's a nice thing to think about between now and the end of the talk. And this is a nice exercise to think about. Why is it that smooth functions from, the, um, from S2 to the, to the reals have um, exactly n critical points? So now the, the parameterization uh, taking 2n plus 2 as the number of critical points should make a little sense. I'm going to be mostly thinking about S2. And now the number n here is exactly the number of saddle points of the, uh, the functions that I'm thinking of. So now we can ask the same two questions again. How many geometric equivalence classes? How many topological equivalence classes? Um, when n is 0, there are no critical points. There's a global minimum and a global maximum. And there is only one up to any notion of equivalence. Here's probably how you should think about these functions. This is probably the easiest way to, to visualize them. Think about them as um, surfaces, as elevations on the globe. And so what is happening when g is 0 is, for example, you're looking at the latitude function. So at the South Pole, you take the value minus 90. At the North Pole, you take the value plus 90. And then as you move from the South Pole to the North Pole, you're slowly increasing all the way around. OK, so when you go to one saddle point, interesting things start to happen. And there are basically two types of behaviors that can happen. And Arnold separated those two types of behaviors by distinguishing between Mount Elbrus and Mount Vesuvius. What's the difference between these two mountains? Well, one of them has two peaks, and the other has a single peak, except, except that it's been cut off. It's got a, co it's got a, a bowl where it should have a peak. And these two guys are going to be different in terms of Morse functions. Why am I thinking of these as Morse functions? Well, here's how I'm imagining my surface of the Earth. I'm imagining that the global minimum of the Earth is located at the South Pole. And I'm imagining that as you move up from the South Pole towards the North Pole, you are just gradually rising. No critical points. And all the action happens at the mountain range that is sitting close to the North Pole. In one case, the mountain range is Elbrus. In the other case, the mountain range is Vesuvius. So these are Morse functions, even though they just look like pictures of mountains. <laughs> Maybe they would look more like Morse functions if I drew them a little bit more schematically. Here's Elbrus with its two peaks. Here's Vesuvius with its, uh, with its um, a crater and its bowl. These guys are geometrically inequivalent, and that's essentially trivial because one of them has two local max and one local min. That's this guy here. Um, one of them has two local min and one local max. That's this guy here. The, lo the other local min, by the way, is D. D is the south pole or the point at infinity, which is actually the global min. So they're geometrically inequivalent. Uh, what about topologically? So let me try to understand the evolution of the sublevel sets. Of course, they start with the empty set. Then you get to a single disk. That's going to be the disk around the South Pole once you cross the value of the local minimum. Then as you increase, what's going to happen next? Well, what's going to happen next with um, Mount Elbrus is that you take in the number C. You cross the critical point at C. And now your sublevel set is the entire surface of the globe except for a little disk around A and a little disk around B. So it's S2 minus two disks. And then when you cross the critical point B, you've got gobbled up the whole of this smaller peak. And so now your sublevel set is everything except a little disk around A. And then finally, you cross A, and it's everything. What happens for Vesuvius? You start with the empty set. You move to a disk. But now when you cross the second lowest critical point B, 
what you are now seeing is two disks. You're seeing a little disk around B, and then you're seeing the little, the huge disk around the South Pole. Then finally, when you, or not finally, but when you cross the critical point C, then you're back to the situation that all that is missing is a little disk around A, and then finally you go to S2. So this is the two different sequences of sublevel sets, and um, I, I will say in a moment that these are um, why these are topologically equivalent, but of course you, you can convince yourself that S2 minus two disks is not topologically equivalent to two disks. I think I have a little picture showing that in a few minutes, so I won't say any more now. Okay, so I've introduced the two notions of equivalence and the object I'm going to be working with, which is the sphere. Uh, what about geometric equivalence? Well, I'm not going to tell you any facts that I can justify in this. It's, it's difficult. Arnold had speculated that the growth rate of geometric equivalence classes was exactly the same as it was for um, S1. And Livu Nicolescu, about uh, four years later, he verified that, that speculation. So what he did exactly was he said, let me form the generating function, the exponential generating function whose coefficients are these numbers I want to find out. And he did some nice asymptotic analysis and some nice generating function analysis and he discovered that the inverse of this generating function is given by some explicit integral. This doesn't come out of left field because on S1, the exact same thing happened. Plug the numbers into a generating function, you get the tangent function. The inverse of the tangent function is indeed an explicit integral. So it's actually exactly the same behavior. Uh, it's just the function is a little bit more complicated. So that left a question. Livu asked the question, for the topological equivalence, classes. What is the growth rate? What is the, the number of topological equivalence classes? And uh, that is a question that remains open, although we now can say a lot more about it than we were able to say a little while ago. So let's think about the evolution of sublevel sets on the sphere. So the, the, the sublevel set sequence always starts empty and always ends with the entire sphere. And actually, I'm going to conflate the entire sphere and empty because I want to think about starting empty and ending empty. Otherwise, the sublevel sets are going to be unions of disks, except some of the disks might have holes punched in them. That's what we've seen in the two examples. Uh, for Mount Elbrus, this is what we saw. We didn't exactly see that in the examples because we saw that one of them was S2 minus two disks, but here's my little picture. Here is S2 minus two disks. And if I just take one of these two disks and stretch so it becomes the outer boundary, then what I get is a disk with a hole taken out of it. So in both of these cases, yes, the, the sublevel sets are always unions of disks. Some of the disks might have holes in them. So what happens when you cross a critical point? Well, I won't go into a great deal of detail on this. I'll say all the things that can happen, but I, I won't say a great deal about the topology that's underlying this. So a, a couple of different things can happen. Either you have your bunch of disks with holes from them and a new disk arrives. You just pick up a new area around a certain critical point. Another thing that can happen is that a new hole gets punched in one of your disks. Another thing that can happen is a disk that doesn't have a hole disappears. The last thing that can happen, not the last thing that can happen, the last thing that can happen is that you had a hole and the hole gets filled in. Those are all fairly obvious things that can happen and you can imagine how they would happen as you can cross a critical point. But there's one other thing that can happen that is quite complex and that adds life to this problem, makes it an interesting problem. And that is that it's possible, especially when you cross a saddle point, that you can take two disks that have holes in them and you can merge the two of them and you keep the holes, but now you've just got one super disk that has as many holes as the sum of the number of holes here and here. These are the only things that can happen as you cross a critical point as you're watching the evolution of the sublevel sets. I would not have been interested in anything to do with this problem if that's how it had been presented to me. <laughs> but no, one day Nicolescu came to my office and he said, David, I want to tell you about the Greek wedding game. I said, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> so he said, David, here's how the Greek wedding game goes. You start with an empty table. 
And then at each step, either you add an empty plate to the table or you add an olive to an existing plate or you remove an empty plate and you smash it to the floor. This is why it's the Greek wedding game. Or you remove an olive from an existing plate and presumably you eat it. Or you merge the olives on two of the plates and you take the now empty plate and you smash it to the floor. This is the, these are the things that can happen at a Greek wedding, said, said Nicolescu to me. Notice that these are exactly the operations that happen when you cross a critical point. So, so he frames the problem in terms of this appealing game of plates and olives. And the game is going to end the first time that you return to an empty place because that corresponds to when you finally crossed the, the whole manifold. And his observation was that the number of topological equivalence classes is exactly the number of games of plates and olives of length 2n plus 1. Now, you can do a little bit of computation. You can figure out what this value is for some, some small values. This turns out to be how the sequence starts. Uh, you can go to OEIS. You won't find the sequence on OEIS. Um, there's an unfortunate issue here. Um, if you search for topological equivalence classes of Morse functions on OEIS, you will find a sequence. It won't be the same as this, and that's because there was a, a, a minor computational error in the original paper from uh, 10 years ago uh, that uh, Tina and I were able to, to clean up. So this is the correct sequence. We just haven't um, um, uh, entered it into OEIS yet. Uh, but even still, you, you don't look at the sequence and say, oh, it's obviously some translation of the Catalan numbers or something. It's, it's, it's not. It, it, it's not anything obvious. So the question is, how is what is this sequence? How is it growing? How is it changing? There's a very nice lower bound on the number of games. And the lower bound connects to another very beautiful combinatorial object, Ferrer's diagrams and Young's lattice on Ferrer's diagrams. There's a very simple encoding of a state of the game via Ferrer's diagram. If you happen to have a plate with two olives on it, that will correspond to three boxes in a row of your Ferrer's diagram. If you have a plate with one olive, that would correspond to a, box, a row with two boxes. An empty plate corresponds to a row with one box. Any configuration leads to a Ferrer's diagram. And the directed graph on the states of the game of plates of olives turns out to be exactly the Hassa graph of Young's lattice on the set of Ferrer's diagrams. So for example, what's happening as you go from here to here? You had a plate with one olive, and you added a second olive. What's happening when you go to, from here to here? You had a plate with one olive, and you added an empty plate. So the, the moves in Young's lattice on Ferrer's diagram, Young's lattice is simply two thing, one thing is below another if it can be contained inside. So this guy sits inside this, guy sits inside this so it's below it in the, the partial order. This guy sits inside this, so it's below it. It also sits inside this, so it's below it. The edges of the Hassa graph of this pole set correspond exactly to all of the moves in the game of plates and olives. Not exactly. It corresponds to all the moves except this interesting complex move where you merge two plates. So if you can count how many ways there are to start here and end here after 2n plus 2 steps, then you will know how many um, Morse functions there are topologically well, you'll have a lower bound on it. You'll know how many don't use any of these interesting complex moves. And um, Stanley has lovely work on differential pole sets that was inspired by um, this particular lattice. And you're able to read off of that that the number of 0, 0 walks is exactly 2n minus 1 factorial. And so a lower bound on the number of topological equivalence classes is 2n minus 1 double factorial, which turns out to be 2 over e to the power n times n to the power n. So that's our lower bound. And um, when, when this lower bound was first published in 2008, the question was asked, is there anything like a matching upper bound? But none was known. So in 2006, Nicolescu asked the question, what is the growth rate? And in 2017, on math overflow, he made a specific speculation. And his specific speculation was that the growth rate of this quantity, when you take the logarithm, is n log n. In other words, this lower bound of 2 over e 
uh, to the power n, n to the power of n is really the truth, at least at the logarithmic level. Um, I have to say, when I saw this speculation on math overflow, I was absolutely horrified. And the reason is that a couple of years earlier, Tina and I had thought about this problem and we worked on it and we got an upper bound and the upper bound shows that this logarithm is asymptotic to n log n. And we thought, yeah, that's nice, but you know, who cares? Uh, we really want a more precise asymptotic result. And uh, I, uh, I, I never have even actually mentioned it to Nicolescu because I, I thought, well, you know, this, he isn't gonna care about this. And, uh, and then one day I logged on to Math Overflow and I saw that he posted this question where he said, I would really, really, really love to know what the logarithm of this number is, what it is asymptotically. And I was thinking, oh my God, we've known this for four years. <laughs> and and here, was, here was why I was really horrified. Uh, because he posted it at five o'clock in the afternoon and I logged on at 11 o'clock in the evening and there had been something like 250 views of the problem. And so I was thinking, oh my gosh, 250 people are now thinking about this. <laughs> So I had to hurriedly write a, a sketch of a proof and post it on Math Overflow. <laughs> so the lower bound is 2 over e n times n to the n. So the lower bound on the logarithm is n log n plus a constant. And so his speculation was that this lower bound of the logarithm was essentially true. And notice that for geometrical equivalence classes, the logarithm of the growth of the, uh, of the number of equivalence classes was like 2 n log n. So this is saying that there really is a significant difference between the topological notion of equivalence and the geometric notion. There are very many few topological equivalence classes than there are geometric equivalence classes. So um, with Tina, we were able to show that the logarithm of this number is indeed asymptotic to n log n. And uh, we were able to get some upper bound that, that we were happy enough with and that upper bound is four over e to the power n times n to the n. So of course that raises uh, uh, the, the obvious more refined question, does this nth root limit exist? And if it does exist, where inside in two over e, four over e does it lie? I have fairly good reason to believe that it's neither two over e nor four over e, it's something in the middle. And uh, probably to, uh, like towards the, in, in the last minute or two, I'll, I'll say something that might uh, lead you to at least think that I have some reason to think this. So let me spend a little while now, um, uh, every talk has to have a proof, let me spend a little while uh, giving you uh, a sketch of how you might get an upper bound of, of n log n. So there are going to be three key observations, but only the first key observation is necessary for an upper bound of n log n. The remaining key observations are necessary to try and drive that constant down all the way to four over e. So if you only want to listen to one thing for the next 10 minutes, this is the one thing to listen to, and then you can definitely switch off. Um, the key observation is that if there happen to be t olives on the table at any moment, then there's a bound on the number of distinguishable plates on the table. Plates are only distinguishable by how many olives they have on them. And I claim that if you only have t olives, then you can only create around square root t distinct plates. And that is nothing more than the fact that the sum of all the numbers up to square root 2t is equal to t. So the best you can possibly do with t olives is put none of them on one plate, one on one plate, two on one plate, three on one plate, and so on. And you get square root 2t different numbers, and you've exhausted your t olives. So here's how I'm going to count the number of games of plates and olives. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specify the type of move I make at each step. Maybe I add a plate, maybe I add an olive, maybe I remove a plate, maybe I remove an olive. And then I'm going to specify the specific move that I make given the type of move that I made. Let's see how that goes. Adding plates is easy. There's only one way to add a plate. Adding olives, there's only ever going to be square root 2n ways to add an olive because there's only going to be at most n olives ever at play. If I have to only take 2n plus 2 moves, if I added n plus 1 olives, then I'd have to remove them, and that would be 2n plus 2 moves already before I'd even done the add an initial empty plate. So there can only be at most n olives ever, so there can be at most root 2n options for uh, adding an olive. What about removing a plate? Well, I have to deal with the complex move here. And the complex move 
says I choose two plates from among the utmost root 2n, and that number is about n. And what about removing an olive? Well, again, I have to choose a plate, and so they're at most around root 2n options. So now I just plug in everything and see what happens. And what happens is the number of games is at most. There are 2n roughly moves, and at each move I have to say what type of a move is it? Plate up, olive up, plate down, olive down. So that's a 4 to the power of 2n. Then I have to pay a price of n to the power of number of plate minus moves. Then I have to pay a price of square root 2n to the power of all of plus moves and to the power of all of minus moves. Now, what am I going to do with this? So the number of plate plus moves is the same as the number of plate minus moves because every time I add a plate, eventually I'm going to have to remove it. So I could really think of this as square root n to the power of p minus plus p plus. This is square root n o plus plus o minus. The number of olive plus moves is the same as the number of olive minus moves. So this is two times the number of olive minus moves. And the two gets rid of this square root n. And what I have is n to the p minus times n to the o minus. Well, that's just n to the power n, because n times I remove something corresponding to n times I add something. So all of these guys together just give me n to the power n. And then I have a bunch of constants like this root 2 raised to the power of junk, this 4 squared raised to the power of n. And I can gather it all together. It's certainly going to give me no more than 32. And so on this one slide, there's the, there's the complete proof that the, the upper bound is really a constant to the power of n times n to the power of n. Um, I have to say that when I wrote it on math overflow, it took a lot longer than this. And uh, Livu said, that's great. But he sort of said it half-heartedly. And then I gave a talk on this a couple of weeks ago at, at Notre Dame. And, and he said to me afterwards, oh, thank you. Now finally I understand. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's gotten much simpler. <laughs> so obviously, I'm giving away things in this, in this proof. So, how can I improve this count? Well, what I want to do in the last few minutes is maybe suggest two ideas that allow me to improve this count significantly. And then that will show where is the, the one missing idea. Um, I want to argue to you that really very few games involve many plate moves. And in order to do this, I'm going to distinguish between two types of plate moves. Simple plate moves where I remove an empty plate, and complex plate moves where I merge two plates. Now, before in my count, I was giving myself a factor of n for either of these guys. But really, I could give myself a factor of 1 for these guys. So for each one of these guys that happens, I can save a factor of n. And so that means that if there are more than around n log n of these guys, I save a factor of n to the power n log n, which is 2 to the power n. And then just by hitting this n, to the n, this n log n with a large constant, I can hit this 2 with a, what turns out to be a small constant. So, well, no, sorry, the, two will, the, the c will turn out to be a large constant, because what I can do is, if I know that there are enough of these plate simple moves, I can depress the 32 to the power n by an arbitrarily small base raised to the power n. So I can dispense very quickly with all of those games in which there are a lot of simple plate moves. But I also want to dispense with all of the games in which are, there are a lot of complex plate moves. And this seems much more difficult. What I have to do is pass thinking about the olives for a moment. And again, I'm going to distinguish between two types of olive moves. There is the first time I add an olive to a plate. And then there's a later time that I add an olive to a plate, the time I add an olive to a dirty plate. The key observation at, on this slide is that there are at least as many first olive moves as there are complex plate remove moves. Because if I remove plates in a complex way 20 times, then 20 times I'm taking away a plate that at one point had an olive on it. So there has to be at least 20 times when I added an olive for the first time. And I was paying a price of square root of n for both of these guys. But for the first add moves, I only pay a price of 1. If I tell you I'm adding a, an olive to a plate for the first time, 
I'm adding it to an empty place. And there's only one way to do that. So if I have a lot of first olive add moves, then I also get a depression. But a lot of first olive add moves means um, that there are a lot of complex plate moves. And so other way around, I do beg your pardon, completely the other way around. If there happen to be a lot of complex plate remove moves, then there also happen to be a lot of olive remove moves. And therefore, again, the 32 to the power n drops by a huge factor. So what I've argued in this slide is that you get to assume that the game that you're looking at in basically involves very, very, very few plate moves. It's all about adding and subtracting olives because the games which involve lots of plate moves contribute negligibly to the total count. They get below the lower bound. How about an upper bound on games that have few plate moves? Well, underlying each game, there's a Catalan path of how many olives there are at any given moment. You might as well assume that that's the entire game because I'm now assuming there are few plate moves. The number of options at a step of height t is about square root 2t. Now I'm not saying square root 2n. I'm actually taking into account how many olives I have. Equivalently, the number of options at an up step of height t is 2t because every time I have an up step, I have a corresponding down step at the same height. I can pair up the up steps and down steps in a Catalan path. So basically what I'm doing is I'm enumerating Catalan paths with a weighting. The weight that each uh, step gets is two times how high up it is on the path. And so the key observation number three is that an awful lot is known about dick paths. An awful lot is known about Catala Catalan numbers. So let's leverage that. And here's what has to be leveraged. There is a lovely result that the weighted sum of Catalan paths of length 2n weighted by the products of the heights of the up steps, this is not an asymptotic result. It is exactly 2n minus 1 double factorial. This is an example here. This one contributes 6. This contributes 4. This contributes 2. This contributes 2. This contributes 1. They all add up to 15, which is a, a double factorial of an odd number. So I don't get to say that my total count is 2e n to the power little o of n times n to the n, because I also had this niggling factor of 2. And it's that factor of 2 that is the gap between 4 over e and 2 over e. So let me end with a, a summary. The main result that I've discussed is that this limit, if it exists, lies somewhere between 2 over e and 4 over e. So the open question is, what is this limit if it exists? I feel like the lower bound is really giving away a lot because it's ignoring these complex merge moves. So the lower bound is probably not right. But the upper bound is also giving away a lot because it's using a, a far from typical upper bound on how many distinct parts there are to a Ferrer's diagram. I'm saying that if you have t boxes, you have at most root 2t or root t distinct parts. But actually, typically, you have fewer than that. Um, there's a result of Wilf that says you have square root 6 over pi square root t distinct parts with high probability. So that strongly suggests that this 4 over e is also giving away something. Uh, where to go next? Well, my first inclination was to think about the S3 and beyond, although I was cautioned recently that I might be getting into a quagmire if I do that, um, because um, Milner has shown that to try and solve this problem for S4 is equivalent to classifying knots in space. So I don't think that I'm going to be able to contribute greatly to that problem. However, there is one very interesting direction to take this work that Arnold was very interested in just before he died and uh, that other people who think about this problem uh, are very interested in, uh, which is not the sphere, but the torus, or other manifolds that are embeddable in R3 of higher genus. And uh, there, there should be some other very interesting combinatorial structures that emerge from, from these problems. So I think this is a fruitful opportunity for interaction between topology and combinatorics. I want to end with two thanks. I want to thank Livu Nicolescu, who uh, ten years, or about five years ago tempted me with this problem. And I want to thank Vladimir Arnold, who tempted Livu. And I want to thank you all for your attention. <laughs> yes, Doug. Um, can you maybe clarify the, the merge moves? Um, 
uh, from what you were saying later, there's some restriction of how many olives are on the plate when you do a merge move? No, there is, there is no restriction. The merge move is simply that you, you take two existing plates and you merge them together. So even if they're both empty, it's okay? If they're both empty, then that would be equivalent to remove an empty plate, and so topologically it would make no difference. Okay. Or if one of them was empty and the other had olives on it, that would be equivalent to remove an empty plate, so it won't change the count. So, so there is some overlap in this. So when you were doing your count, I think you were, you were saying when you were merging things, they were not empty, and that, and that would be the reason why. Yeah. Yes, I, I guess I've lost my pointer, but I, I, I guess in, in uh, like retroactively I can... Uh, I can point to uh, <laughs> my little asterisk. Uh, these, these differences end up in the asymptotics making no difference. But yes, one has to be, one has to be quite careful. Any other questions for David? It's dangerous to sweep anything under the rug when smart people are listening. <laughs> If there are no other questions, let's thank David one more time. Thank you.